Hello and welcome to this special. Technically, the Satyam Saga, the scam that we saw in 2008 around Satyam, one of the biggest IT companies, doesn't really fit into the making of modern India. A uh, period of 100 years, 1900 to 2000, where we are seeing uh, how things shaped up for the emergence of a modern India. But no discussion on Indian IT can be complete without referring to that moment when the world thought that the hard work put in by thousands would go and completely disappear because of one man's folly and the collapse of a very large IT company. How things were put in uh, uh, back in shape, how uh, the industry came together to really fight against all odds is a, a, a famous case study across the world and something that we ought to be very, very proud of. Today, I have great pleasure in introducing three men who played a very critical role during that period when the world couldn't stop talking about India's Enron moment, the Satyam scam. Joining me today are Dr. Kiran Karnik, who was, of course, uh, uh, the man that the government turned to as they put in a new board at Satyam. He was the chairman of the government appointed board. He was also before that the president of NASCOM. So he was the right man to take charge uh, of the beleaguered company. I have uh, Dr. Ganesh Natarajan, who was a chairman of NASCOM. And he was the man responsible for going across the world, trying to ensure that uh, the reputation of Indian IT and Indian IT companies was intact. And then you have uh, C.P. Gurnani, uh, MD and CEO of uh, Tech Mahindra, who interestingly was the man who came in as a white knight to save uh, Satyam. Uh, the Mahindras, of course, bought Satyam. But what is interesting, and I remember speaking to C.P. about this many years back, is the fact that the Mahindras almost bought uh, Satyam at an obscene valuation <laughs> a year before, and it didn't quite happen. And that really is a story in itself. So gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to have all of you to together today. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, the one question I'm sure you are asked every time anybody sees you for the first time. And Dr. Karnik, I'm going to start uh, by uh, asking you that question. Looking back, how is it possible that nobody got an inkling of what happened with Satyam? I mean, the entire industry, and I, I know as a journalist, we were all surprised, shocked at something like this happening. Frankly, Minnie, I have no answer because if you had asked me the day before the bombshell which uh, Raju threw through his letter, I would have, and let me put it very bluntly and directly, I'd have given him a character certificate on a stamp paper. And I'm being very frank and truthful because what I had known of the person, what I had seen of him, including his chairmanship of NASCOM for a period and what I'd interacted with him for many years, I saw a man who seemed, you know, humble, very hardworking, determined to build up his company, uh, ambitious, but not flashy, not given to showing off uh, either in terms of where he is or who he is or how big he is. But yes, he wanted to build his company for sure. He had ambitions and I don't know what it is. So clearly I have no answer except for what one person told me, who would be familiar because he's written about it, I can mention him, uh, Gucharan Das. He told me this is the Mahabharat moment. Yeah, It's the children and the family. So this guy, as you say, may have been good, but he got rid of it. But frankly, that speculation, I don't know, is a simple, short answer to your question of, you know, did anybody see this coming? Did I see it coming? No. Did anybody else see it coming? I doubt there are people who have great rear view mirror visibility. I don't. And I don't know whether they really had it or no. But frankly, I don't think anybody really saw this coming. The company and the man had got all kinds of awards, including for good governance. And uh, I don't think there was a really any inkling, except slight signs a month earlier when the Metas affair started. But that's the that's story in itself. Mm. Right, Ganesh, what was the reaction at NASCOM when the letter first came? Because you were all peers, right? I mean, by then, Satin was the fourth largest company like uh, Dr. Karnik mentioned, uh, Ramalinga Raju was already, had been the chairman, um, uh, you know, uh, is somebody you've known very well. So what was the reaction within NASCOM? Well, honestly, it was a shock because I still remember I was chairing a company meeting in Zensar in Pune that morning. And I just got a message on my phone. I think it was a text message saying, do you know this has happened to Satya? And... While I was still listening to a presentation, I looked at it quickly and then said, guys, we have to stop this meeting and went out and made a few calls to So Mittal, who was the new president of NASCOM. Mm -hmm. And they were all shocked. And I mean, I completely concur with what Kiran just said, 
that he was an amazing chairman of NASCOM. He was a very simple man, very visionary because the kind of strategy that he would come up with even for NASCOM and Kiran will remember because he was president when we did the strategy committee was quite amazing. So it was an absolute shock that something as profound as this would happen to a company like Satyam and probably perpetrated by a gentleman like Ramanikar. CP, uh, in your case, it, it would have been an even bigger shocker because I do remember you mentioning that there were various attempts made to reach out to Mr. Raju the year over the year before this actual scam came out because uh, Tech Mahindra was keen to acquire Satyam to have some kind of a deal there. And, uh, you know, a, a back of the envelope for calculation, uh, Satyam at its height was about 36,000 crores uh, in valuation. You finally picked it up at what? Uh, um, much, much lower at about what? 5,800 crores odd. I mean, that was a valuation change that happened. But what was your uh, perception when, when you heard about this? Because you would have also done some number crunching, right? As far as Satyam is concerned. Oh. I do want to admit, uh, Mini, that uh, uh, we always had this advantage that we had started the company. You know, when Kiran and Ganesh talk about, you know, the Raju as a chairman or Raju as a CEO of a company, I mean, trust me, it was like, you know, meeting him over three days and finding him in the same, same set of clothes. You know, he was that humble and that simple as a human being. When it came to his vision, it didn't matter where, what you were discussing. I mean, even the EMRI or HMRI, which was the, today HMRI, nobody recalls it, but it was the first remote health management solution ever rolled out in any public service. Today, you know, almost... Uh, 13 years later, it has become now taken for granted that you can do remote health management. Similarly, EMRI, which is now 108, uh, all across India, was the brainchild of this man. So he was a genius. Unfortunately, the truth does show that he was a flawed genius. And during our earlier due diligence, one thing used to always come out, why is the company on pen and paper, I mean, now we know it was pen and paper at that time, why does it have so much of cash? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it was very, very clear they needed working capital to fund their business. But somehow, you know, you start saying that, uh, you know, you, you always leave it as a point for further due diligence because all other data always showed that Ramalinga Raju was running a very, very successful company adored by the clients, adored by the employees, and adored by everybody. And I can also say that as I went in as an ambulance driver, you called it a white knight. I mean, uh, as an ambulance driver also, all these years that I stayed in Hyderabad, there was not one individual who had anything bad to say about Raju. I mean, he always treated people so well. He was always so nice and so humble. I mean, he was humility personified. Yeah, I have been to the Satyam campus with him where he took me around the Satyam campus. I interviewed him and I second that. But you know, we will come back to the man and, and sadly how the legacy of the man has now vanished because of this scam. And like uh, Dr. Karnik said, it was that, uh, you know, uh, moment, uh, the Mahabharata, the rushed moment kind of thing where, uh, you know, you had the, this, uh, the son, uh, you know, or the, or the kids uh, influencing him. But let me come to you, Dr. Karnik, you know, uh, what were your concerns when you walked in uh, to, to uh, pick up the broken pieces? Because you had 45,000 employees, if I'm not mistaken, in Satyam at that point. Some of the marquee names internationally were clients of Satyam and uh, they hadn't seen it coming either. So take us through those first couple of days, first couple of meetings and what went on. Um, some things I'll talk about, many some things I won't, but I can tell you one thing. Then to me, and I, I think uh, this may come up as we discuss later too, but due credit where it is due, the government. You know, Raju's letter came on January 7th, if I recall the dates correctly. By January 8th, I got a call initially, and by January 9th, 
they had already decided and they wanted to consult me as what do I think? Consult in the sense, I'm sure they took many opinions. What do I think of who I should be there? They had already consulted and, you know, very, very actively NASCOM involvement and NASCOM played a seminal role in this, particularly in those early days. On January 9th, they'd done everything, put this in place. On January 10th, they were issuing an official formal order. January 11th, I got a call, we've done it, the order is there. It was a Sunday, if I recall correctly. It was a Sunday, I don't remember the date, I think it was January 11th. And that very evening, uh, Deepak Parekh uh, and Mr. Achutan, who used to head at one time the securities up in the tribunal, he had retired from there. And I, who were the first three directors on the board, flew into Hyderabad on that same Sunday evening. We met over dinner, that was our first meeting, and that set the pattern, by the way, for what followed, we would always have a pre-board dinner meeting to discuss uh, off informally all the agenda points and see where we go. And there, one of the first things that came up was just what you said. You know, 45, 50,000 people, there, there have been numbers, whether they were right, inflated or not. Subsequently, everything that we picked up didn't show any inflation numbers. Around 50,000 people, such a large company and an iconic company. And the concern for me was certainly what was concerned for the IT industry was what is the impact not only on the 50,000 employees or on Satya, but what's the impact in the Indian IT industry? And as I told friends in government that, look, I'm out of the IT industry now, but this is our lead industry, it's our image globally. And therefore, this industry, which is considered so well governed, not just in India, but around the world, if you see something like this here, foreign investors into anything, into power, roads, anything, will begin to wonder, you know, for every Indian company, should we be there or not? So the impact is likely to be, you know, a multiplier effect, many fold beyond Satyam or beyond the IT industry. And this was a deep concern. But the employees, as you said, were, were you know, a worry. And in many ways, those dates are important because, uh, you know, I don't want to go into details on this one, but uh, we had to pay a number of statutory requirements, not just in India, but around the world by the end of the month. In, in India, you would equal, consider the equivalent of PF. And if you don't pay those, you're able to do anything from being hauled up to going to jail. And some jurisdictions like Singapore are very strict on this sort of stuff. In some places, we're paying salaries half monthly. So January 15th was the date. And the worry was with all this happening, and you know, as, as CP rightly said, it seemed to show a lot of money in the banks, but was it there? We didn't know. So how do you take care of that? So multiple worries. Uh, but one more I want to mention, and you know, hats off to Deepak Parekh for the foresight in this. One of the first things he told me when we met over that informal dinner on Sunday was, hey, we got to make sure that with all these things happening, none of them get hauled up. We can't do anything about countries outside, but at least in India, let's make sure that somebody doesn't go file a FIR somewhere and we get called to court and get you know put into jail or whatever. And he says, it, it'll be terrible for us personally, obviously, but it'll also be like a disaster for the company. So that very evening on the phone, he got in touch with lawyers, got them lined up, said, come soon as possible, let's discuss and go on. So I think it was a great thing on the part of the government. And that's why I said, uh, credit not given where it's due. You know, NASCOM certainly did a fabulous job, but the government in terms of not just acting, but so promptly, and then listening to sage advice, because the first reactions, mm -hmm. and again, I mentioned this only in passing is, you know, where did think, yeah, this is a new era in India. Uh, yeah. Private companies come and go. Somebody made a mess. Investors will lose, very sad, but that's the way of the world. You know, I mean, companies come, they go under, some liquidation, bankruptcy, whatever. We see how to help the employees, but that's it. Second extreme, other extreme was back to the good old socialist days. Hey, big company in trouble, politically sensitive, elections for the country, you know, Lok Sabha elections coming up in six months. Let's just take over the company, nationalize it. And they found this very nice wire media where they were able to put us in and get there. And the last part of, of the meeting and the people I mentioned, the three people and then three more they added later, including Tarun Das and Manoran and uh, LIC nominee, and name will come back to me in a moment, uh, was that the initial reaction of saying, let's get experts was not the way to go because the first reaction was IT industry, IT company, assemble a board of six IT guys. Mm. And as you will see from the people on the board, none of us frankly knew anything about IT. I spent many years in the IT industry and even more years in ISRO, but I'm not an engineer. And therefore, my knowledge of technology was whatever I'd absorbed by just sitting around with clever people like CP and Ganesh and others and absorbing whatever I could from them. Same in ISRO. But I was not uh, IT, nor was Deepak or Tarundas or Manoran or Achutan. 
And that is good because that is what the company needed to get back on its feet. It didn't need IT expertise it was enough in the company. What we had to do were other things. So first concerns, employees, image of the industry and what beating it might take and the country indeed of where they are. And second, then down to earth concerns, salaries, PF, uh, legal cases for the company and for us and what do we do? Mm, especially complicated because you didn't know what you were getting into and how bad the balance sheet was. So there was a lot of uh, opacity over there. You know, Ganesh, uh, IT by its very nature deals with sensitive information of marquee companies across the world, right? I mean, that's the very nature. And trust plays a very important role in that. Uh, you know, when the scam was happening, I mean, I know you uh, telling us, uh, you know, how you were on the flight, you know, visiting some of the big uh, headquarters, trying to make a case for India. Tell us what happened over those weeks, over those months. Uh, what was the reaction to something like this? Was there a risk that the entire IT industry would suffer? Um, what, was, what was it that you were picking up from uh, Satyam stock plans? A couple of things happened, uh, Mini. One is, of course, I mean, some well-meaning analysts literally on 8th or 9th did a global call on what can now happen. And there were lots of negative spe speculation. Unfortunately, they invited us, so we kind of tried to allay those fears. But thanks to that and thanks to genuine concern, I think you know, a lot of clients started reaching out. And I remember, I mean, two of their biggest clients, one in North America, one in UK, actually said, look, we don't believe what you're saying. I mean, as, as Kiran was saying, you know, where is our faith in the whole industry? And in fact, two weeks later, I was on a flight. I went to San Jose in California, met one of their principal clients, who interestingly was also a big client of ours. So I knew her very well and kind of assured her. I told her everything that the government had done, told her the background of people like Deepak and uh, Kiran, et cetera. And she was kind of assuaged to a certain extent. On the way back, I remember I had breakfast in Fortnum and Masons in London with one of the biggest utility companies, CIOs. And he said, look, I mean, this is really disgusting, et cetera, et cetera. But he promised that he will wait for a couple of months before he pulls out his business from anybody. I mean, it wasn't helped by the fact that some companies, I mean, obviously saw opportunity and were kind of fueling the fire, if you will, saying, oh my God, you know, this company is going to go down. We should immediately move all their business from this company to our company. And I think we also put out some kind of a request. And I remember Sumitral, the president of NASCOM, very much part of that, saying, guys, let's come together. Let's make sure that we look at this as an Indian IT issue and not as a competitive. And I think to a, to a large extent, industry really rallied around. And as, as Kiran rightly said, the combination of government, the combination of a very, very credible team now managing the board, and a lot of both back office work and front work with the customers we did, I think that combination kind of saved the day for Indian IT and definitely for Satya. Simi, did you also get queries from your uh, clients? What was the reaction in, the, in, in general? Because, you know, till then, Indian IT was seen as a, a, a very squeaky clean, uh, you know, business. I mean, it was really about techies, technocrats who had led from the front. It was... Uh, the hero of India, so to say, you know, in many senses. What was the kind of pushback that you saw from clients? What was the reaction? As a CEO yourself at that time, what was your big concern? So many three parts to this answer. Number one is we really had very few common clients. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't a client telling us anything. But remember, we were always interested in the company so we had some access to the clients of Satyam. Uh, so that is the second part. And we are now talking about a chapter between 10th of January and 13th of April. 13th of April is when Kiran decided to hand over the keys. Mm. And during that period, all we were doing is getting data because the data room that was set up by Satyam was actually in EDK. And there was really not enough time for the data room uh, to actually give you every bit of information. So we had to do our own surveys and own feedback. The reality is the financial services sector were grappling with their own challenges. And they told us in not so many words that it doesn't matter what Satyam story would be. We will not do business with Satyam. 
because for us to go back to our risk management committee and to say that we are doing business with another uh, you know uh, scam hit company we are not going to do business and that was true across the board for the bfsi customer mm -hmm. the other people wanted to know almost on a daily basis of what's going on and that is where i think the role of the board the grit and the determination of the satyam employees actually played a more important role and the camaraderie between the nascom uh, team all of us would get together practically on a daily call and we would have discussions about not to poach employees the third part is all of us were joint at the hip that this is about india's reputation and india's image so i think it is a classic story of actually rallying together during crisis employees rallying rallying together the board rallying together and competitors rallying together all trying to save satyam what was the thinking dr karnik because it's normally you know it's a very highly competitive market of course clients are very uh, prized these are long term contracts that one is looking at uh, in that interim and you know every week every day counted because they could just cancel contracts you know so at this stage what do you think looking back worked what was this coming together all about you think a, a, a few crucial things mini one was just what cp mentioned and you know i do want to mention that uh, uh, my my book on nascom and the it industry is titled titled the coalition of competitors it ends with saying that the mantra for the future certainly for indian industry it industry also for people and countries maybe compete but cooperate and the book starts with january 7th you know 2009 and the reason for that start is because it exemplified what the book talks about which is how the industry competes intensively tremendously with each other and yet they cooperate and you know i picked up many 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 examples but i think this was a outstanding example of how the industry came together as ganesh mentioned the initial thing which nascom did between som and ganesh of you know talking to all the industry ceos the top companies and saying hey let's not poach actively if somebody comes that's different i think that was critical because everybody is looking for talent and satyam as cp mentioned earlier had a great reputation for delivery that excellent people so who wouldn't want their team so the first requirement was that the team shouldn't disappear and you know when we first took over i realized in the first few days something that's obvious that we had two critical things which are interconnected employees begin to leave the clients are going to say hey my team's half gone what am i doing here i'm shifting if customers begin to leave the employees are going to feel look i don't know whether first of all i get my salary but customers are deserting us already this is a sinking ship they start going and then these two would reinforce each other so we had to build in infuse confidence in the customers saying look satyam has delivered very very well so far and we had to get out of this nice alliteration which media is out saying satyam scam and i kept telling every customer it's not a satyam scam if at all it is you call it a raju scam satyam is a great company with fabulous people and great teams who have done your work and you know that and that carried some credibility with them and then with the internal folks any number of town halls first with senior level and then down the staff and senior level it's something obvious so don't mind mentioning it we don't know who are complicit so whom do you trust in the top team you know we had no idea who was involved the general sense was hey it can't be just raju it has to be a few others helping him to do such a thing so who are those no idea so who do you trust who do you work with the fact that customers i had faith in what was done so far and you know this was reinforced not just i made in the first few weeks any number of calls and important i should mention this again without overplaying that and saying the fact that i'd been present in nascom itself carried great deal of credibility they knew nascom and they said even those who didn't know me said oh you are you were present in nascom and immediately that carried credibility to tell them look you had delivery perfectly from satyam so far we will ensure that but if you feel dissatisfied give us a few weeks maybe 3 or 4 weeks if you feel dissatisfied i guarantee you that i will ensure a smooth transition to whoever else you want to go to that's a guarantee and the credibility that you know nascom name which you know i carried over had lent some credence to that saying we will help you and no customer can walk out overnight they know that as well as we do so this carried some credibility 
and for many of them it was completely mission critical i know a major major international airline that told me very frankly look if you walk out of you or your team walks out on us from day after tomorrow i might do open for a day from day after tomorrow i'll have to start cutting flights in a week i'll have no flights in two weeks i might get back by going to somebody else but i'm going to have a major deputation be down the train the other concern was what cp rightly mentioned some of the companies in fact many of them were deeply concerned how will this affect their reputation because they're getting services from a scam hit company and the kind of things that had gone on around the world after 2008 people especially in the bfs i sector were very sensitive so you know it was kind of concern that you had there so these were the immediate ones and you know i think the fact that the government tascom the whole of it industry and our board from satyam could work together and had the backing of an excellent you know workforce in nascom which in, in satyam which is dedicated and hard working and proved themselves really helped the the saving of satyam is a great case study of what the government did right and what it should have done time and again every time we had a crisis in this country we just really get uh, uh, you know the most respected names together to get uh, the industry together and to get policy makers industry leaders everybody together to try to meet on a common cause we've not had that replicated elsewhere we've had many issues after that uh, dr karnik so this is one of those a few few uh, occasions uh, but uh, ganesh let me come to you you know you've been leading this whole series for us on the making of indian it very important uh, period of about 20 30 years starting with the 80s uh, and how technocrats led this uh, revolution which really created so much of wealth so much of goodwill and so much of reputation for india and indian industry uh, from the perspective of that what uh, is the importance of the saving of satyam uh, you know uh, initiative if i could use that word in the context of what you have done how does it bring it all together i think it's absolutely critical mini because i mean as i have said many times in the last two months we've been doing this show this is an industry created by middle class people okay who came in and who built not only wealth but wealth for as mr namurthy was saying you know in his conversation with us i mean wealth for thousands of people across the industry so i mean that's what we are proud of and suddenly to find that one of our entrepreneurs who also obviously comes from a very very middle class background raju grew up in a little village called bhimavaram near near in andhra pradesh so he was very much part of that community to say that look somebody like that you know could suddenly be suspect would cast as persons on the entire industry so i think that is always an issue and i just want to to lighten the mood a little i'll just share an anecdote that happened i think two or three months after satyam i was still chairman of nascom and i remember i got a call from one of the very big tv channels saying that look we just like to ask you a couple of questions and that's when they asked me a question it was just a, literally like a 5 minute i was surprised myself how short it was sent a crew home and they just asked me saying do you think the government should be saving satyam i said absolutely the government should be saving satyam there's a doubt about it okay and i didn't know why they asked me this question when i saw the channel later and this was like 2 hours later they were interviewing a bihar politician on the kosi river flooding okay and the question was do you think the government should save the people from the kosi river or should they be saving satyam so naturally the politician says the kosi river and here is chairman of nascom saying they should save the industry so i'm saying sometimes there are so many funny twists to these stories it is it was extremely important for us to say that look this is an important issue i mean you could argue that you know saving millions of people who suffered in the kosi river is equally important but we felt it was mission critical we felt it was very important to save the reputation of the industry as kiran has been saying and cp has been saying and honestly if i look back in that chapter in history we came out stellar we can all hold our heads high and say that look we really showed the metal the resilience this industry is all about like right. cp let me get you in here you know you went on of course to pursue uh, satyam again you were one of the bidders uh, who actively looked at it uh, what made the mahindras look back at satyam as an acquisition was it uh, in some senses uh, also about uh, you know um, being the white knight the the moral high ground was it the fact that it still made great business sense because you know of course you got a lot of goodwill and a lot of uh, you know uh, attention for what you did but uh, did it also make sound business sense to you at that point i mean what was the thought process behind the, this uh, this acquisition 
So many, in a lot of ways, continuing on, you know, the role that Ganesh, Somital, and Kiran Karnik's board played. There was a lot of communication from them also about the stability of the company and that the perception of the fraud is not just the fraud of one individual, that the customers also want this company to be stable, this company to serve them for the same reasons that um, many, many mission critical applications were dependent on uh, Satyam engineering talent. Uh, yes, it was a calculated risk. And in a lot of ways, I can say that the boards of the various companies that I had to deal with, I had to that time deal with the Tech Mahindra board. Uh, I had to uh, present it to the board of MM and the board of uh, British Telecom. Yes. Because everybody considered not about, there was, was not worried about the risk part of it in terms of customers. It was just that how deep is this cancer? I mean, how many people in that food chain are toxic? And what other, and you have to also remember during the same time that Kiran is talking about, I mean, there were people who just came to take advantage of the vulture play. I mean, there is a company which sued uh, Satyam that time for theft of IPR. And, and the vulture play was, it was actually bought over by a vulture fund. And the vulture fund was suing uh, almost a company who didn't have a future. So our worry was more about dealing with every investigation agency around the world. Every, uh, more than 15 or 16 new court cases within two weeks. And also uh, not having exact data. But the reason the Mahindra board, the BT board, and the Mahindra, uh, Tech Mahindra board backed us up is obviously uh, we were very convinced as a management team. And to be very honest, uh, to a large extent, Anand Mahindra also supported us to take that risk. And it was almost like no risk, no gain. Guys, go ahead. Uh, I'm there to back you up. But I promise you that it was a situation, Mini, where one of the board members to deflect us told us to go and find a private equity investor. Not one. I made personally made pitches to 11 private equity funds across the world. The only one who actually agreed at that time was the Wilbur Ross. But Wilbur Ross put so many conditions as if he was lending money, he wasn't really, uh, you know, co-investing. And we had to go back to the board and say that we would like to go do it all alone. So it was good fun. Uh, and again, whenever I look back, I mean, people who have not got credit to the extent they should, I believe Anurag Goyal, who was then the, the corporate secretary. Number two is so Mittal personally paratrooping and addressing employees, doing town halls before the board got appointed and Im almost immediately coming in and providing that relief. Because as they say in any surgery, the first 72 hours are critical. While the board was being appointed within those 72 hours, I don't know Kiran if you remember, but uh, Som pretty much was the first uh, firefighter who landed on the on the ground in Hyderabad. Very much so. So I do believe that two people who have got less credit is Anurag Goyal and Som Mittal. Hmm. But you know, what also amazes me, Dr. Karnik, is how quickly it kind of got controlled and, and suitors came on board. Because, you know, like you rightly said, you were dealing with uh, a very big question mark, a black hole. You didn't really know what the situation was how deep the malaise was, because of course, there was a lot of money transfers, money, um, you know, between related companies, uh, uh, you know, mysterious companies that had raised bills. There was a lot of uh, 
uh, it was a quagmire. How, what do you think worked? Was it the fact that uh, it was a problem larger than a company? Uh, how did you, did you have to go and pitch to suitors? I mean, like CP saying that he went and pitched to uh, PE firms. I'm sure you had so much in your mind that you wouldn't have had a chance to do it, but you would know that they would, some kind of help would be needed to bail out uh, Satyam, so to say. Yeah, Mini, but you know, I, let me step back for just a little bit before that. You know, this is, this is surprising and it tells you what happens. Uh, after the first couple of months, when things began to seem stable, customers stayed on, employees stayed on, uh, there were many in government, not few, but many, who felt that this is fine now, you know, and we don't know, there are too many unknowns. If you sell this company, what will you sell it for? Will you put a floor? If you put a floor, what will that be? And how do we know you're not underselling? And then remember, these were days in the country too, when scams were beginning to just surface. And there was a great deal of worry that this would be considered one more thing where it's been sold off at, you know, throwaway prices just for the economy. And there, I, I do want to, you know, re-emphasize what CP said. Anurag Goel and a few critical people in government played a vital role. But this was such a serious issue that uh, at, at, at one of the top levels in government, again, I don't want to mention names or who, uh, somebody really in charge, uh, asked us that this is the point of view I'm getting from many of my very senior advisors and bureaucrats. Then company is stable. You guys are in a hurry. You want to put this out and begin to sell it. So why are we doing that? And uh, two other colleagues with me tried to explain in detail the intricacies of IT and why we need to do this. And I knew I could see from his body language we're not getting through. So I tried something which is so crude and simplistic, but somehow that worked. I told him, look, this is this is like fruit or vegetable in the market, in the, in the shop there. You know, first day it has great value. It's fresh and you have high value. Second day, it's not bad. You can set, sell it here. Third day, you have to pay people to take it away. So we got to act quickly. That's the only way this is going to work because there are too many unknowns. We don't know what, how long this will last, how long we can hold on. And then, of course, we move forward greatly. But again, the other point I want to make is what CP said now. You know, there are just too many uncertainties, too many possible court cases, too many legal possibilities. And yes, I, I yet remember what he mentioned, the vulture sewers who wanted to see what they could get out of the, uh, what they perceived as maybe a dying carcass. But we were really worried about what bids and how it's going to go. And so, you know, hats off to, you know, CP and his team who persuaded Anand Mahindra and boards of three different companies to, you know, go ahead with this. We had one other bidder who had pre-decided that he is going to get it. He wants to buy it. And he's the kind of person who decides he wants to get it, he gets it. And uh, I think I made a long-term enemy by saying, hey, you didn't sell this company to me. I mean, it's, it's entitlement, you know, but that was that. And then we had one more interesting bidder who backed out, again, no names, who went on saying all kinds of things. Fortunately, his credibility was low and he had gone through a lot of unsuccessful ventures and partnerships in India. So, Kiran, so, I want to interrupt and only remind you when Ganesh said that he is going to add humor to the story, I thought of the man with the white hat, not the white knight. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, CP. And you know, I, I must tell you, now from the board, we had quite a time dealing with him. And you know, obviously, he was very well connected at, at uh, political levels too. So we went through a lot of that. And uh, you know, uh, I, I, I must tell you that in, in the midst of all this, Andhra Goel, who was Secretary of Corporate Affairs whom CP mentioned, told me once, and his minister told me very directly, he said, look, I used to say I'm Minister for Corporate Affairs, and he wrote to my constituency, he's from the northern part of the country, he said, Ye kya hota hai? You know, I'm what, what on earth are you doing? Nobody knew of it. He said, suddenly now, I'm the best known figure, I'm, just, I'm probably the second or third most known minister in the cabinet. I'm around there all the time, thanks to you guys. He said, no, thanks to us, thanks to something that happened. But even he, who maybe very wrongly, let me preface it with that, didn't have a great reputation. He, he stayed off us. And there, I, I must say that uh, we had strong backing from those who mattered in the government, number one. And number two, I think a lot of us, if not all of us in the board, uh, didn't have anything to get or give to the government. And so we could just stand firm on whatever there was, whether it was state government, on which we had our own skirmishes, or people in the center, or sometimes some of the bureaucrats. Most of them were helpful, but we did. But end of the day, it was the people like the Mahindra group and key individuals like CP who did all the due diligence on a company that you didn't know what due diligence meant because you didn't know which figure to look at and trust. And the data room, and someone told me, you've got a great data room. You guys have put in a lot of effort to get it together. But 
you know, all your data is quite meaningless because I don't believe any of it. So, you know, you can take your pick on that. All audited statements, you go back how far, at what date you validate, no ideas at all. So it was, it was a leap of faith and, you know, a conviction, I think, that drove three bidders, of whom two were very serious, to, to go ahead and get it. We started by saying great story showing Indian residents and where we were. But you know, this story would have had only half a happy ending if we had stopped around there. The happy ending part has come after hard work by the tech Mahindra folks to put it back on its feet and make it again one of the most successful companies in India because that is what has brought credibility. If you just you know let the company survive and sort of uh, run it on oxygen, that wouldn't have been quite this happy ending that one would want in this fairy tale. It's a fairy tale only because of the godmother or godfather and grandfather. Right. I will come to that. I will come to the journey beyond uh, beyond the headlines because we often forget about that, right? When we are talking about a moment in history. But Ganesh, I'm going to, uh, in uh, the spirit of humor with which we are talking, I'm going to add another interesting dimension which we used to joke about was the fact that you know, often it is said that the IT industry has done so well in India because the government didn't quite get what the IT was for the longest time, right? So it, it managed to do its own bit in its corner with a largely global uh, client base, etc. And so they were kept out. And so they also say that because the government didn't get it, they didn't have any, uh, you know, uh, I think any intention of nationalizing Satyam because that's normally what happens, right? When there's a crisis or a scam, the first thing that you do is nationalize the company. So in this case, they didn't know enough to nationalize. Would you agree with that? I'm not, I mean, first of all, I think it's, I mean, this was actually a story created by the first IT minister, Pramod Mahajan, who used to, yeah. as you remember, say, only two industries have succeeded in India, IT and beauty. And beauty was, of course, because of Sushmita Sen and Aishwarya Rai. And he said, because there were no government department. But he used to say it as a joke. And a lot of people took it seriously. But as 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 we remember the, our discussions with Nandan and Narayan Murthy, sure, there's been a great government role, right from Mr. Vittal and Mr. Sheshigiri to making this industry what it is. And I'm not too sure about the nationalization piece because I think the government can take a lot of credit, as we have said, for having a very good interim board and also, of course, very quickly to get Anand Mahindra and CP and others to come in. But I think there was no real need for those kind of extreme steps. And I think it was almost a fairy tale. I mean, if you if you played back in 2020 hindsight, it looks like everything went well. But remember, every day was a new day. Every week was a new week. And a lot of things went right in this story. And I think that's what is important. And everybody played there. You know, uh, CP, um, once the camera uh, cameras were off you, once you did acquire the company, it was done in phases. You know, you retain the Satyam name, then you merge it with Tech Mahindra. It was a process. Uh, 13 years down, what do you think were the challenges in getting it all together? And was it a bet that paid off for, for Tech Mahindra? I think the results speak for themselves that today, what is called as enterprise business of Tech Mahindra is really the Satyam business. Uh, what we inherited was about 900 million, 13 years later, that's approximately 3 billion. So, Clearly, the bets have paid off. Uh, number two is, uh, when you look back, I mean, let's not underestimate the risks that were associated with it. And there, that was the reason why it was kept as Mahindra Satyam for a while, and then merged into Tech Mahindra. The first rationale was that we, as a company, have to make sure that the shareholder of Satyam, while we may have bought it at one fourth, one fifth of the cost, but that person has also paid a price. And we owe it to them that we complete what is called the repair phase. We complete what is called the dealing with all kinds of court cases and dealing with all kinds of regulators. I mean, remember, this is the company which got deal estate. It was fined by almost every stock exchange, and it was also being investigated by every fraud agencies around the world. And at that point of time, we had to make sure that the shareholder who has not panicked is also not losing out. So I think it worked out very, very well. And uh, 
Number two, as, as I said, whenever I look back, it becomes very, very clear is that it was a good call. And more important is that the best thing that happened was the spirit of Satyam. Because the employees actually were rallying together uh, to not only save the company, but also save the reputation of Satyam. So in a lot of ways, keeping the name Mahindra Satyam, and trust me, you got enough advice at that point of time that Satyam is a tented name. Nobody would name their company Enron. Nobody will name their enterprise a Satyam, or nobody will name their son a Satyam. Why are you keeping Mahindra Satyam as a name? And uh, I think it worked out very well because the employees associated with the word Satyam and for them, it was a very, very important gesture that we believed in them, we believed in the company. You know, looking back at what happened, of course, uh, you know, it also uh, shows that when uh, there is a will and there is a uh, uh, coming together solutions can be found fast. And that's what happened with Satyam, the entity. The criminal case against uh, Ramalinga Raju uh, went on for a long time. And it's only very recently that uh, there was some kind of closure there. But uh, Dr. Karnik, uh, looking back, uh, what do you think is the legacy of Satyam? What is the, I would ask you in two parts, what are the learnings from that period, if you were to look at it as a formative period for the Indian IT industry and Indian industry as such? I, I don't know what kind of broad learnings one can take away many because whatever I can think of and say, which is not just grip, can be in some way, you know, countered by something else. I mean, if you talk of the importance of corporate governance, it's obvious, it's a motherhood statement. But uh, who, a company that's got uh, the, the top awards for corporate governance and has, you know, one of the top four uh, worldwide global firms doing their audit, what more can you ask? So, this becomes very difficult, but I think the learnings to me are, are two or three things that we, we might want to look at. One is that the boards, and I'm glad they've done this now, they, the board with independent directors needs to have a fixed term or a short term for independent directors. If you're too long there, even the best of persons begins to develop too much confidence in the promoters or the CEO, and you just assume that the person has done so well so far, so it's fine, I don't have to go too much into this. The second one is in terms of systems, and that's a little more detailed, but this was one of the findings I've taken away from Satyam in a broader context, not in the, that if you, if you, you know, silo things and the interconnection between them is a different interface, there's a danger. And I said, this is a broader point, it has not to do with accounting systems, which are separate between two things, and there's a gap in between, which some one person is able to control and link and manipulate, but also more broadly, you know, actually almost a philosophical sense that two separate things you need to make sure that there's a holistic view of it. The third one is what we have spoken very much about, the possibility and the need for working together and putting together as a team with a common objective. And the last one to me is something you mentioned, and you know, Ganesh talked of the COSI and so on. And I think you know, this, is, this is absolutely true. I've seen it time and again. We as a country or maybe as a people culturally are great in dealing with crisis. But when it comes to routine work, the inefficient, sloppy, and not doing it very well, you know, goofing off. But when there's a crisis, hey, nothing like, you know, the Indian expertise, uh, call it innovation, call it jugad, call it improvising, whatever name you give it by, and then the capability to handle that. I think that's a lesson. And, you know, we need to see how we can take account of that without waiting for a crisis. And that's the big, big challenge that, you know, if you, you have 91 with, uh, you know, sending out our gold to repay our debts, and then suddenly that crisis triggers something which creates a seminal change. And Satyam is one more example. And, you know, I go back many, many years and say, you know, 10 million people coming across the border from Bangladesh. Today, when we get 5,000 refugees from Myanmar, we are cribbing and screaming and shouting and being inhospitable and terrible, which we have never done in our past. I mean, you have 10 million refugees from Bangladesh, you are able to handle it. So I think the crisis brings out the best in us. And it's unfortunate, we've got to see how to not work in crisis mode all the time to create efficiencies, but to translate that and take the learnings from that into what we do on a regular basis, both in industry and as a country. Yeah, well said. See, uh, in, in the scheme of things, what do you think are the big learnings uh, from uh, Satyam? And do you think, looking back, it was, it was just a blip in the larger story of India's IT? 
So when you look at uh, India's story, I would like to believe it was a very, very important part. The important chapter here is A, about the rallying together of the industry, because that is unique, rallying together of the corporate and being able to run a process under camera. No meeting that we had with the board of Satyam was ever held without the presence of X number of lawyers or a justice and not being recorded. So the point is it was transparent, it was open and it was executed in time. So my personal belief is that it is a very, very important lesson that if you want to achieve something, uh, if you are, and if you are transformation wise, if you know the end goal, then everything else can fall in place. And it is for us, all of us to take a lesson from this and continue to adopt it. It could be about any transformation program. You may be doing well, you want to do better. What did it teach you? It told, it told you that if you communicate well, if you put all the data on the ground, on the table, your all stakeholders, competitors, customers, employees, and every stakeholder will rally together as long as your end goal, you are very clear. We complicate things by trying to hide things. Great. Well said. Thanks, CP, for that. Ganesh, I'm going to let you have the last word of this. See, I would still assess him exactly the way Kiran started off. I mean, that he was a thoroughly good man, a gentleman. You could always approach him with any question, any problem. Uh, I remember one week before the Satyam thing broke, my wife Uma and I were actually having breakfast at his house with him and his wife. And she was I mean, always a very gracious host. I remember him trying to convince my wife to take over as CEO of EMRI. And it was so funny that one week later, his explosion breaks. So you would never have guessed it. So I think Ramlingaraju, the man, to my mind, I continue to have respect for what he accomplished, both in Satyam, as well as, of course, in NASCOM and so many other places where he kind of did a good role. Obviously, obviously, history will remember him only for the, for the tiger, riding the tiger letter that he wrote. So I think that can't be helped. But I think one thing, one thing that I will always remember, and I remember at two, three months after this, I was having dinner with my company in, uh, in, in Bombay, in Worli. And in the adjoining table were, I think, uh, Anand Mahindra and probably CP and his management team. I'm sure they were having a celebration dinner. This was just, just after the, uh, the acquisition. And Anand came across to my table and said, thank you, Ganesh, for all, all that you've done. I took that as a real generous acknowledgement of an industry leader through the whole NASCOM, the IT movement. And to my mind, that is my memory, my, my memory always. And a blip that Ramalinga Raju may have been does not change the fact that there are so many people who have built this industry together. Residents of NASCOM like Som and Kiran and of course before them Devang Mehta, now Devjani and so many others. And, and of course, Mr. Chandrasekhar who was on our show recently. But if you take the presidents, take the many, many chairman of NASCOM, take all the 4.5 million people who are in NASCOM, I think this is one industry which has shown that it has the ability to rise above the odds and make things happen. So I'm really proud of being part of this and being part of a group of people who make these things happen in, a, in a, almost like an everyday sense. Right. And it's been wonderful to chronicle this story, Ganesh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karnik. Thank you, Ganesh, for this wonderful series and this wonderful conversation, because it's really the spirit of can-do and collaboration, which really proves that, you know, when we have a will, we can do pretty much anything that we want. I wish more industries took cues from, uh, from the IT industry, but of course, the story is still being written, isn't it? So there's a long way to go. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you.